All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by uh, Dr. Britt Andretta. How are you doing? I'm well, how are you? I'm doing excellently. And if you haven't heard of uh, Britt, she brings over 25 years experience helping people and organizations raise rise to their potential. She's written a number of books, uh, The Neuroscience of Learning, Creating a Culture of Learning Organization. Um, and what we really want to talk about today is her latest book, which is all about teams and collaboration. And it's called Wired to Connect. And um I'm I'm fascinated to learn more about this because yeah, there you go. Wired to connect, perfect. Thank you, thank you, Britt. And by the way, where are you today? I'm in Santa Barbara, California. Oh, beautiful! And I'm here in North County, uh, San Diego. So we're in the same state. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, we we make we talk and we focus a lot on teams and putting teams together and collaboration and all of that. But I don't think most of us. Uh, really understand how collaboration really happens because you know a lot of the times we think well it should happen naturally right or it should just grow organically because we're all wonderful people right and we're all like you know very talented and we just put a bunch of people together just natural collaboration will happen um is that the case Actually, no. And there's a couple reasons for this. One is that we use the term collaboration when we're really talking about cooperation mm -hmm. and coordination. So I like to first start by helping people clarify that because when we work nicely together, we mm -hmm. play nicely or I do my part of the task and you do yours, that's cooperation. And right. it needs right. a very different skill set. We need to have an agreed upon goal. I need to be clear about my part, you, your part, we do it. And the kind of skills we'll use are planning, efficiency, communication, executing, that kind of stuff. Collaboration is an act of co-creation. It's when we have been tasked to solve a problem, but we don't know how, how we're going to create it yet. We actually are all contributing, and whatever we're building is changed by the very nature of our contributions. And so it's this, this place of co-creation. It's, it's also a place of tension because we're going to be kind of having differences of opinions or, or different values that we bring to it. And so for collaboration to really happen, you have to have the setting or the process in place for people to be able to build trust, respect each other, um, be creative. They feel safe enough to be creative. And in addition, they also have to be good at conflict resolution because mm -hmm. conflict is going to be in there. So I think part of it is, you know, we, we actually ask teams to go back and forth between cooperation and collaboration regularly, but we don't make it clear when they're doing what. And then you have to really give people the skill set and the environment to truly collaborate. Yeah, and that's uh, in, that's an interesting, uh, interesting um, distinction that you're making there. Because, I mean, we may look at teams that work very well together, and we may say these these guys collaborate fantastically. But from what you're saying, is they may just cooperate fantastically, and they're all doing their own thing, but they're not um, achieving breakthrough thinking, right? Because they're not having that creative conflict. Correct. Correct. And so you can have a, teams that are performing well and playing nicely together. And a lot of work gets done that way. Mm -hmm. But most organizations count on kind of these peak performing teams that are truly understanding how to innovate and collaborate. And that's actually a very rare thing to achieve. The good news is we're wired to to work that way with others. Our brain is actually built to, to uh, engage in those processes. But what happens is when we set up teams to work together, um, we inevitably harm their ability to collaborate early in those interactions. So if the team is, you know, as we all know, groups kind of develop along stages mm -hmm. and it's in those first two stages that either safety, physical and emotional, psychological is established, as well as a clear sense of purpose and what they're supposed to achieve together and how each person will contribute. If those two things don't happen early on, the team can never achieve full collaboration and hit that peak that peak state. I have a, a model that I built from the brain science and I, I call them the four gates of mm -hmm. uh, peak team performance because you can't get to gate four if right. you don't have 
things in place. So what ends up happening is harm gets done in those first early stages and the team, instead of moving into a healthy way of working together, they go into a type of dysfunction Mm -hmm. where they're not trusting each other. They're withholding information. They may not be leaning in and bringing their best work to the group. Um, There's a lot of things. And then the team just kind of stalls out and it it may perform okay, but it's not going to be something that really helps the organization achieve its strategic goals. Yeah. There's a couple of interesting things to unpack in there. So one of the first things I I wrote down here is this idea of uh, conflict and creative conflict. Um, It seems to me nowadays that we spend an inordinate amount of time trying to avoid conflict, right? And that it's almost culturally it's become this thing of, you know, you have to avoid conflict and people have to be happy and all of that. And obviously creative conflict isn't people just attacking each other because they don't like each other. It's, It's trying, it's it's you know ideas going back and forth and really trying to get to the best idea do you do you find that is that we have become very conflict diverse because we don't understand the creative power that it it it, it contains Absolutely. I mean, people tamp down conflict when conflict is actually a healthy thing if it's not toxic. You're right. So if people are doing things to demean each other and to undermine each other, you have toxic conflict. Mm -hmm. If they're just having passionate conversations and trying to convince each other, as long as there's space for listening, that can be very healthy, right? So we have to teach people how to listen. And, and truly understand another's perspective, even if you don't agree with it. We have to find ways to have those, those spirited conversations without taking a turn to meanness. And then some of us have to, to get a little more comfortable with that, right? For some people, if they grew up in a home, and you know, all of this goes back to our childhood. Sure. If you grew up in a home uh, that was abusive, even the smallest sound of conflict, mm-hmm. you're going to want it to stop. And other people who grew up in loud you know, fighting families, but everyone loved each other, they'll, they'll go at it and have no problem with it. So we also have to help people um, ease their way into the conflict of the group. And, and you do that by building trust first, because if you and I have trust, and then you come at me in a very spirited way one day, John, I can handle it, right? <laughs> right. But day it might scare me. So we also have to help people get there. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, I, I grew up back in Ireland in a small house, small and there were seven of us, so five kids and two parents. So we all knew. We all grew up knowing how to, shall we say, uh, fight our corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, that first temper thing is nothing to mess with. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an. But that's. But there's some interesting things in there, though, because obviously, as we're looking at, you know. Uh, the newer generations coming through this is this could potentially be somewhere because they're highly creative people but it could be somewhere where there's a little bit of a deficit right because um you know it's a pretty we see a lot of as i said conflict aversion but also not you know hiding behind electronics and not really you know confronting things face to face and all of that and yes a, a lot of collaboration can be done um, virtually and that today, but it still doesn't overcome the fact that if I, if you need to say something to me that maybe I'm not, it's not going to be that comfortable for me. If you haven't any experience in doing that, that's going to be a difficult thing for you. Yeah. I mean, you know, so I'm a big believer in when we bring teams together, particularly teams that we want to hit that collaborative and innovative, you know, do innovative work and and be in collaborative collaboration. We really need to set them up with both team training, Mm -hmm. which is skills they need to be good at being a team and team building, which is the time they need to build those relationships. And part of team training is both knowing how to give and receive feedback. Right. Right. Give it in a way. I always believe in 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 um, truthful, but kind. <laughs> so you got to be able to give somebody the brutal truth sometimes. But there's a way to say it kindly. Right. Mm-hmm. And then on, on the other side, you got to be able to hear it. You have to be able to hear critique without it just crumpling your self-esteem or or sending you into intense defensiveness. <laughs> It's like that thing, you know, they say, you know, with couples, if you're going to deliver some, you know, uh, a, a difficult messages to hold the hand of your partner while you're doing it, because it's a lot harder to, for them to get upset if you're physically holding their hand nicely, not like tightly, yeah, obviously. Them. <laughs> yeah, not, away, right? yeah. So, so in your book, you talk about the brain science of groups and teams. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? What, what is the actual science and what's going on, you know, neurologically within teams? Great question. So 
The good news is that when teams are in good shape, neuroscientists can absolutely see it on MRI machines. There's three cool things that happen when a team performs well and has trust with each other. The first is neural synchrony. They, they start to not only have the same regions of the way, brain light up, but they are brain waves come into uh, wow. the brainwave patterns align. Um, and in fact, there's a neural signature for different kinds of parts of the work. So when you're kind of debating options, that has a certain brainwave to it. When you're, when you're um, having conflict, it has a certain brainwave. But the team will come into neural synchrony and you can see it. Another key signature is this, it's called sense of we. And that we have now become a thing that we know we're part of and we're in this together. There's this psychological shift that instead of it being a bunch of eyes in the room, we are a group. And then the third thing is a rhythm of team, which has to do with when groups work together often, how quickly they get into that neural synchrony state. And then if something disrupts it, how quickly they get back into it. Mm. So there's this rhythm of team thing. The good news is that happens with the group. The bad news is there's prerequisites. Mm -hmm. And the requisites is the people have to feel safe with each other. And so if you've got someone in the group who's particularly aggressive or if someone is harassing somebody on the side and no one knows it, um, the minute one person on the team doesn't feel safe, the team collectively is now hobbled and right. cannot achieve its full, its full potential. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating because there's a few things that you mentioned there and throughout the conversation is one is, you know, trust and you're saying, you know, building safety. And one of the things I noticed in in – in in your work is this idea of we don't come to a team pure right we don't become we come with some unconscious biases as you said with our upbringings whatever it is with our experience of conflict or not of conflict or avoiding conflict whatever it is so there's a lot of these things so how do you how do you number one how do you recognize unconscious bias <laughs> well, that's kind of a trick question, yeah, right? Yeah, no, it is. It's a bit of an, I know I realize it's a bit of an oxymoron. We don't because it's unconscious. Mm -hmm. So how we manage unconscious bias is that we can train ourselves to look for signs. Mm -hmm. So some signs is if we are internally uncomfortable or super comfortable, mm -hmm. you know, like that place where, oh, I just preferred this candidate better than the other one. Mm -hmm. Well, why? What was that mm -hmm. about, right? If we're in, a, you know, if we're feeling really critical or judgmental, that's kind of a sign. So what we can do is we can look for signs that it might be at play. We also, as a group, can become sensitive to what are the common areas for unconscious bias. That's really regional. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, that's very much around race. Mm -hmm. It's in place for gender. It's in place for sexual orientation, right? Um, and and in different parts of the world, uh, which group is considered kind of the normal or the group that's in power or not marginalized versus the marginalized group. So you can start to be kind of come sensitive to where you should pay attention. Um, and then more importantly, we can put things in place to protect against it, right? Because if not everyone is conscious or, or tuning in, right. what you want to do is have things like a blind hiring process. So you don't know people's ethnicity or gender, or that kind of stuff going in. You're hiring standards, using really standardized criteria that are clearly defined so that everyone is judged according to the same criteria. Those are all things we can do. And then, you know, because we do c come from the society we're raised in, mm -hmm. we can all work on intentionally challenging and unlearning stereotypes. Right. We've all been fed at school and in the media a bunch of stereotypes, and these influence our thoughts, actions, and decisions. And so what we want to do is start to go, huh, if every time I see African Americans, for example, on the news, they're either in the role of criminal or they're misrepresented Maybe that influences my feelings about, mm -hmm. I need to look at that. I need to unpack that. Same with women. You know, we've been mm -hmm. fed a lot of me messages that women are not as capable as leaders. Well, that's a bunch of hooey and <laughs> we need to just challenge that. Right. Mm -hmm. So these things that we can do around that. And so have you seen though, um, so have you seen where teams that are, you know, more diverse maybe in their makeup, uh, can be can be more creative and collaborative than teams that maybe are homogenous or have you know a single you know maybe a single viewpoint or or you know a regional makeup or whatever 
Yeah. So uh, there's two things I want to say here. Absolutely. Diversity yields better decisions, better products, better everything, mm-hmm. right? You've got more points of view. And, and, and so diversity, when you truly embrace it, it means people are going to have some discomfort. They're right. going to mm-hmm. be around folks that maybe challenge them or, or ideas or perspectives that aren't comfortable for them. So, so, so then of course we have to put in place the team training and the team building so that they have the skills and the conflict skills to manage it. But the most important thing that can happen is that the leader says we are all part of a we. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is that our brains naturally sort for us versus them. Right. We can have an us and them, but if we're put into us versus them, our brain does some stuff that's hard to overcome. And when you look at a lot of corporations, they put people in competitive competitive situations. Mm -hmm. And then later they reorg and they want people to be on the same side when before they were against the (laughs) other group. Our brains don't recover from that initial framing. So leaders have to be really careful. You definitely don't want to go to us versus them. If you have an us and them, it's a little bit better. But ideally, when you say we're all part of team whatever, um, team this company, team this project, the brain naturally then can start to see the other members of the team. Even if there's major physical and, and philosophical diversity, our brains can see us as part of the same group. Yeah, and it's interesting. And I just wonder, too, is it is it to, to your point, is it then when – that you have to be careful that, you know, when those periods of 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 conflict or stress or whatever come about, that we don't immediately retreat into, well, that's just happening because I'm the only Irish person on the team. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think it's two things. You know, when if teams are set up for success from the beginning, and I really believe mm-hmm. in in investing in time in person, our brains do more with in-person interactions than just on the screen. Um, and we help people build trust and skills, then that will overcome uh, miscommunications or conflicts. However, we can't ignore the fact that people do discriminate against each other mm-hmm. and do harass each other. And so we also have to start to believe people when they say it's happening to them. Right. You know, a person can recover from it happening to them if people around them believe them and if the issue is addressed. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other thing is anyone who's leading a team, if someone comes to you and says that they're not comfortable or that something happened, if if you turn a blind eye, um, yeah, you may ignore the issue, but your team is now never going to achieve true collaboration or innovation. Right, because you're it, that's it comes back to that all important trust issue, right? Because um, you know they're not going to trust that you're really uh, you that you really have everyone's interests at heart. Um, the other can, thing, can I add sorry. one more thing too. It's important to realize this is not about being liked. Sure, it doesn't have to be popular or liked by the group. They have to feel valued. Mm-hmm. They have to feel like their contribution makes a difference and is valued or respected by the group. If that's in place, you're good. Um, so it's not about being popular, having everyone sing Kumbaya. I always make sure that that's clear. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you raised that point, actually, because I'm going to talk to that one first. Is um, I'm glad you raised that point because, again, I mean, I think this has become kind of has permeated our, our, our culture now and it permeated business and the way is this idea of that it's all about being liked and being happy right that you should be happy every day in your work which is nonsense right i mean we all have stuff to do that if we if if the 10 percent of our job that we love is worth the 90 percent or whatever it's 70 percent that you don't love then that's fantastic but this idea of being happy all the time being liked and you can't you can't really achieve breakthrough with everybody worrying about everybody being happy all the time can you no. And so I, part of the model that I've come up with has to do with purpose rather mm. than happiness. Right. Purpose is actually deeper and more meaningful. And if you feel like you're contributing to something that is purposeful or has meaning to you, that's what matters. You know, this thing around being liked, no, you don't have to be liked, um, but you have to feel safe. You have right. to feel physically safe, which when I started doing the research, I was astounded by some of the data at how much workplace violence and workplace bullying actually exists. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people don't feel safe. 
And then in addition, there's that psychological safety that you're not going to be excluded or marginalized because mm-hmm. you had a viewpoint that was different or you challenged your boss or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so it means that we're all going to have to become you know, more flexible, a little more tolerant, listen to each other more and find ways to respect each other, even when we don't agree, you know, and honestly, this is playing out on the big stage. I was going to say, if um, I just, I could just take that clip on its own (laughs) and just send that to everybody, regardless of where they sit on the political spectrum right now. And just say, for goodness sake, if you could just, if everybody could just dial it back a little bit and be able to deal with the fact that that's the beauty of the world is we're not the same. Yeah. And if I could say just a little bit more on that, you know, recently uh, members of the party say that if they go and extend a hand across the aisle, it means death with their own constituents. Mm -hmm. Then that means that us, the voters, and remember, most people don't vote still. Mm -hmm. Those of us who vote, you know, we really have to start to, to, to tell our leaders that we do expect them to work collaboratively and to find the places of common interest. You know, uh, we can blame Washington, but we can also look at what we do to make them earn our vote. And I think we've put people in very narrow boxes that makes it not easy for us to get anything done. Yeah, so yeah. I want my leaders to be able to collaborate. I want them to find the places of common interest. And I think that's we, we need to all ask for what we want to see. Yeah. And I would like if uh, if people are going to spend 30 billion on an election, I would like to see that 29 billion of that is not spent on negative campaigning. Yeah. <laughs> but um, one one last thing that I just wanted to ask you about here is motivation, right? So when you have a group of people in a team, um, you you can have a common goal and all of that. But but individuals have different motivations, right? So how do you how do you how do you harness and reconcile that and make sure that they're not at odds with each other? Well, two things. You know, when we, when a group is brought together and the purpose is identified, I think it's really important for the team leader to make sure that everyone can see how they're going to contribute. Mm-hmm. Because as long as people feel like they can make a meaningful contribution or they can bring their strengths to the project, that's the most important piece. So you have to make sure that aspect of people's different motivations are addressed. If you've got someone who's got a skill or a motivation that has no place in this project, what are you going to do with them? They're, they're not going to feel like they can contribute. And then they're going to be scurrying around trying to find ways to influence it and maybe not in the healthiest ways. So you have to be thoughtful about who you bring to a team and making sure that each person's role is clear to them and the rest of the group. The second thing you have to do is make sure you appoint team leaders who are good at creating collab- environments for collaboration. Mm-hmm. This is one of the biggest mistakes organizations make, who, who typically is the team leader is the rock star performer. Right. Mm-hmm. And this person then uses the team to achieve their vision. The best team leaders have what's known as collaborative intelligence, and they create the environment where, which brings out the best in everyone else and facilitates people in collaborating. So we have to be, um, we have to sh- change who we look for and appoint to these roles and also what training they get. And then, you know, the third most, the third critical element here is the team has to be held accountable as a unit. Mm -hmm. And we fall apart on this all the time. We say, okay, people, we're bringing you together and it's going to be hard and you got to achieve this thing. And supposedly you're all in it together, but at the end of the day, we do your performance reviews separately. So I'm an advocator that, you know, when you think about the NBA, you know, and the, and the NBA championships, it's not like some of the players get a ring. You either all get a ring or none of you get a ring. Yeah, that's true. Professors learned this a long time ago. If you assigned a group project, you had to say, all of you will get the same grade. Mm -hmm. Otherwise the group will just splinter. So at work, we got to do the same thing. We at least need to have a percentage of people's performance review reflect their team work. So if you and I are on a team and let's say 30% of the work we do for the company is team-based, 30% of my performance review needs to be a team score. And John, you and I get the same score. If we (laughs) lead with the project, we get the the great score. And if we bombed the project, we get the same score. That's the only thing that's going to hold people together through the difficulty of conflict and challenge and working working in some of these environments so mm-hmm. you really have to find ways to hold people accountable as a unit yeah and that is going to promote kind of you know self-management group you know that group dynamic of self-management Absolutely. There has to be some skin in the game or else people will, you know, the minute it gets hard, I'm just going to focus on performing my best so I get a good review. And that's not necessarily what's best for the team or the project. 
So um, we're bumping up against the end of our time here. So the big message that I'm taking away from here, and again, the book is called Wired to Connect, is that is is for everybody out there, is that um, the best teams don't happen by accident, right? It's not just a, f a fluke. You happen to have a bunch of people that came together and they happened to spark. Uh, it's something that needs a deliberate strategy behind it at every stage in order for it to be successful. Yeah. And, you know, what happened for me when I was when I was doing the research and writing the book, I had some big aha moments around like, oh, so this is what happened when I was on that sweet spot yeah. with one team that I loved. We were crushing it. That's what was going on. And oh, that's what was going on with these other teams. So, you know, we've all felt it, I think, when mm -hmm. we've been part of it. And now we can really understand it. And when you can understand it, you can create it again and again. And so that's why I came up with my four gates to peak team performance. It's something that you can use over and over to get teams to that peak state. And then also knowing that people can't sustain there forever, right? right. So when you're there, you want to protect them and let them run as long as they can. And then when something shifts, how do you rebuild it? Yeah. So all well, it's, possible it, things. It's, and just, just for a moment, just going back to your sports analogy, it's the same thing. It's like, um, you know, winning the Super Bowl once is a fantastic achievement, but it's way harder to win it a second time or a third time, right? And it's the same with any teams in sport. You can have a good season, but it's it's sustaining that over a period of time. It, that's the hard Absolutely. part. I guess it's the same with uh, with teams in work. You can be kill it on one project, but if it's not protected and nurtured, maybe you're not going to kill it on the others. Absolutely. And when you know what to do with a team, you can start to consistently build peak performing teams. Right. It's possible to do it. You just got to, it all happens in the early stages, not when it gets critical. Absolutely. Listen, this has been a fantastic conversation, but we could obviously talk for a lot longer. But before we go, do you want to tell people a little bit more about you and how they can learn more about what you do? Oh, thanks. Yeah. So I'm the former chief learning officer for lynda.com, which is mm -hmm. now LinkedIn Learning. I've always been in learning and leadership. That's what my doctorate is in. Mm -hmm. And um, I've started really focusing on the brain science of success. So all of my books, I have three out now, have to do with the brain science of things. And I also build learning solutions that you can get certified in so you can roll it out in your own organization or bring it to other groups you work with. So I've got solutions um, out on change. My team's one is coming out over the holidays. Days, and, and I'm building a brain savvy manager series that'll be out in the spring.